Hi all, I had a couple of patients come in with a cavus foot type this week so I thought I would put together a short um, video on the assessment that uh, I performed. The first guy had mild Charcot-Marie tooth disease and underwent surgical correction of the right foot only when he was a teenager. Yeah. Uh, the other patient is idiopathic. It's uh, important to remember that most pes cavus patients have some type of neurological um, diagnosis and the most common of these is CMT. Even in the idiopathic cases there may be a very subtle neurological lesion that is below clinical detection. During the clinical exam uh, we need to find out if the cavus deformity is isolated to the forefoot refoot or if it's a combination of both. Starting with a non-weight bearing exam, let's have a look at the refoot first. We're looking at the elevation pitch of the long axis of the calcaneus, which in a cavus foot is uh, usually greater than 30 degrees. Clinically, I haven't seen a pure refoot cavus foot in a very long time. Uh, if I had x-rays, obviously you'd be able to uh, confirm this calcaneal inclination on the lateral view. Now we look at the forefoot. Uh, you need to assess if the forefoot is in valgus or has a plan flex first ray. Assess if the first ray is flexible. This will give you a clue if the subtalar joint will pronate or supinate due to this plan flexed first ray. In this case, you can see there really isn't much flexibility within the uh, in the first ray. If there was flexibility in the first ray, you may find that with weight bearing, it dorsiflexes and in turn causes the subtalar joint to pronate. If it is rigid, like in this case, that usually doesn't happen and it causes the subtalar joint to invert instead. So what really is happening is that the inverted refoot is secondary to the forefoot valgus slash planiflex first ray. The next non-weight bearing exam, you want to have a look at forefoot adduction or metatarsus adductus. Now look at ankle dorsiflexion with the knee extended and flexed. If ankle dorsiflexion increases with the knee flexed, then only the gastroc muscle is tight. If there is no change with the knee flexed or extended, then the gastrocelial complex are both tight. This is excluding that there's any osseous ankle equinus. Now let's have a look at the weight bearing exam. Make sure that the person's feet are pointing straight so you can visualize the inverted calcaneus. If the feet are abducted, noting the inverted calcaneus, is harder to do. Now you may think that applying an everted refoot posting on your orthotic um, will then evert these patients back into a more neutral position, but uh, most of the time this is not the case. You can test this clinically by applying a lateral wedge to the heel to see what happens. In this case, trying to evert the rear foot doesn't really change the inverted angle and all the patient said was that they felt like they were putting more weight onto the forefoot. To test if the rear foot is being inverted due to compensation for a planflex first ray, you can perform the Coleman block test. I didn't have a block or a step to use, so I used uh, these wedges and placed them underneath the fifth metatarsal head. You can see the calcaneus everted to pretty much neutral in both these patients. So we can say that in both these cases, the rear foot varus alignment is forefoot driven.